Thanks, Vicki. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to talk about seizures and epilepsy. And it's a, obviously a very common uh, problem in many of our consumers. And we'll talk more about the, the rates of epilepsy um, in our population, but it is higher than other groups. So kind of the place we wanna start is, you know, what are seizures and what are convulsions? And the way I like to think of it is that um, seizures are an electrical event, whereas a convulsion is kind of the result of that, where you see the uh, movement parts of what comes along with a seizure. And I'm gonna show you a little um, kind of illustration in just a moment of brain and the, the nerve cells in brains and transmitting their signals. But the brain is uh, made up of nerve cells and then supporting structures to hold those nerve cells um, to provide function. And the way those cells talk to each other is, is through electrical events that are um, um, caused by what we call depolarizations of membranes and an electrical charge moves down those membranes to another nerve cell. And what happens with a seizure is that you have a, an electrical disturbance. Something uh, sets off a signal when it really should not. And so because of these um, abnormal um, electrical impulses, then you have parts of the brain being activated um, at wrong times and that shouldn't be, and that results in a seizure. And a seizure can then be, um, end up becoming a convulsion, which is what you think, uh, what you're used to seeing when people have um, a seizure, they, they end up having convulsions, which is the muscular contractions and things that happens um, with a convulsion. So uh, let me show you uh, this kind of a, I thought it was a cool little video here on electrical um, signals going through the brain. And uh, some cool music um, behind it. Okay, so these are nerve cells. Those are the cell bodies, and these are the dendrites and the axon that goes down and touches another cell. And so what they're illustrating here with the lights is the transmission of that electrical signal from one nerve cell to another nerve cell. Here you have two cells connecting and you have the release of neurotransmitter that goes to this cell and activates it and creates that electrical signal that goes on down the nerve. And these are neurotransmitters being released connecting to receptors. And then the signal moves on down now, obviously, this is happening very, very quickly in the brain, and different functions happen as that goes on. So let me get out of here. I think you get the picture. But that is just um, sort of obviously a dramatic uh, presentation of what nerve signals look like in the brain. So you have a bunch of um, brain cells. They have a cell body. And then they have these little things that hang off of them that are called dendrites. And that's where another nerve cell will talk to it through these dendrites. And then the electrical signal will go down this one long thing called an axon. And that goes down to another nerve cell, connects to its dendrites. And you have the impulse traveling along. And obviously in the brain, there are different things that, that happen. We, we, um, we have um, movement things that happen from the brain. Uh, um, smell, sight, all those kinds of things that happen in the brain. And so the kind of seizure, or, or excuse me, the area where the seizure is will then determine what kind of result you see. Okay. Okay, so when we talk about epilepsy and seizures, epilepsy is a disorder and seizure is a symptom of epilepsy. And normally we don't make the diagnosis of epilepsy based on just one seizure alone because epilepsy is a seizure disorder. It's characterized by um, more than one seizure or uh, repeated seizures. So that's why we also call epilepsy a seizure disorder. Now, 
because our brains uh, produce sensations, um, feelings, uh, sensory things like seeing and hearing and all those kinds of things, these all depend on electrical signals. And when seizures happen or these abnormal electrical impulses traveling through the brain, it can cause problems in all of these different areas. And so again, the important concept here is the recurrent seizures is what makes epilepsy. Now, um, for a first seizure, we may or may not put that person on medications. Often uh, we may not because many people will have one seizure and then that's it, no more. And so they don't have epilepsy. So we wanna search out the cause of that seizure if we can. And um, if there's a cause that we can identify, then we try and, and treat the person for that. Um, but uh, generally we try to wait and see if it really is epilepsy or a seizure disorder before we um, begin medications. So and it turns out that um, about one in 26 people or something, somewhere around 4% uh, roughly of the population will be diagnosed with epilepsy. And that is roughly about 150,000 Americans per year. It's a very costly disorder, not only in cost of therapy, but also costs like loss of time at work, um, loss of ability to do certain kinds of functions. Like if you have uncontrolled epilepsy, you're not going to be doing things like driving a truck or flying an airplane or those kinds of things. That's why we have to control the epilepsy. But the, the financial burden to the healthcare system is um, over $15 billion a year. Uh, in terms of care for these folks and also treatment. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, epilepsy in the intellectually um, disabled or developmentally disabled population. About one third of children who have epilepsy have some other form of either intellectual or developmental disability, whereas um, IDD and DD is associated with a, a significantly increased risk, about 35% in one study, increased risk of having epilepsy. And I can tell you that in reviewing um, medications and such for our consumers at VMRC, um, epilepsy is a big burden in our consumer population. Um, many, many consumers have epilepsy. Um, intellectual disability alone um, is, is about an 8 percent, I should say chance, not char, uh, change, chance of having epilepsy. Um, and brain injury after birth is upwards of 75 percent. In fact, brain injury, um, whether it's through trauma or stroke or something, is a, is a big risk factor for developing a seizure disorder. And the uh, chance of a child uh, with a developmental disability having a seizure by the age of five is about four times higher than a child without. So you can see there's increased uh, risk and clearly in our population, um, it is something that we uh, commonly encounter. I mean, many of your consumers are gonna be on these anti-seizure drugs. But on the upside, there's about a 40%, again, that's another type of 40% charge, that it, a chance <laughs> that a child with a developmentally disability and epilepsy will be seizure-free on medications. So that means that uh, depending, of course, on what their underlying condition is, cerebral palsy versus um, you know, intellectual disability or something like that, um, many of them we can, uh, through one or often more anti-seizure drugs, can um, help them to become seizure-free or certainly uh, with reduced seizures. The other side of that coin is that there are many of our consumers at VMRC that have really severe uh, seizure disorders and we may not be able to entirely um, get rid of all of those seizures. Um, there, there comes a point where you just can't keep adding medications and because the medication burden with side effects and such um, is just more than we can, can uh, do to keep them seizure free. So we do find um, some consumers who continue to have seizures even though they're on medications. Now, about um, half of people with epilepsy develop it, develop it before the age of 25. Um, so that's the most common age for what we call idiopathic um, epilepsy. After that, um, common causes are trauma, um, 
drug use, things like that that can result in seizures, but it can occur at any age. Um, and again, as I said, the incidence is higher in the population that you and I take care of. So many, many of our consumers on these anti-seizure drugs that we'll talk about in a few minutes, and some of them are not easy drugs to um, stay on, by the way. Some are easier to tolerate than others, but some can cause significant side effects. So the other thing about epilepsy now is it affects a person's life. It's not just that they have a seizure and then everything is fine. Um, quality of life is impacted. Some of the earliest studies looking at the impact of diseases on the quality of life involve patients who had epilepsy. It clearly uh, affects that. It affects our ability to take care of activities of daily life. Um, I think I have something in a slide here later on that talks about some things that you have to be aware of around the house. If somebody doesn't have um, controls uh, epilepsy and they're at risk for having a seizure, there are certain things you don't want to have them doing, like being uh, necessarily leaning over a stove while it's on and cooking, because if they have a seizure, they might fall over on the stove. There's just a number of things that you have to take into consideration. Um, people who do not have well-controlled seizures cannot drive. And in fact, if you were to have a seizure and you go to the emergency room, they are mandated by law to notify the DMV. And depending on what state you're in and such, um, there will be a time frame within which you have to be seizure free if you're going to get your driver's license back. So I think you can see that uh, depending on what one's uh, career is, this could have a huge impact. I've had friends in my own life who were, for instance, truck drivers who could not drive until they'd been seizure free for a, a period of time. Um, so it can have a real impact on your ability to um, earn a living and do certain jobs. Um, cooking, as I said, can be an issue. You have to be certainly very careful about that because there could be danger of you having a seizure while you're um, around the, the uh, stove. What about taking care of children? That, that could also be an issue. If you're taking care of little children and you're the only person there and you have a seizure, that could be an issue. Then there's some other things that can can, that can impact medically for us. So for instance, many of the, or some, I should say, of the anti-seizure medications um, can affect things like bone health, calcification of bone, and, and some can affect um, the endocrine system. There's just a number of things that these medications can impact so that the epilepsy itself can also impact um, their other medical conditions. It also is associated uh, with a predisposition to depression. And so one of the things we typically do when we're following these folks is to make sure that we're looking at their mood. We're asking them um, how they feel. Epilepsy itself is associated with a higher incidence of depression, but also the medications that we treat them with, um, depression can be a side effect of those medications. So we have to watch them closely. And then lastly, there's a, a, a phenomenon called sudden unexpected death, and it's a small number of these folks who have epilepsy can actually um, die, not during a seizure, they just they um, pass away. And we're not sure what, what goes on with that, but it is a phenomenon that happens in a very small number of people. So I have a video here I wanted us to watch about um, living with epilepsy can negatively impact a person's quality of life in many ways. The unpredictable nature of seizures can be a major problem in school, employment, and of course, driving. Think about the impact of a child having a seizure in the middle of class. This can be very stressful. For many jobs, having a seizure can be dangerous. For those who work at heights or around heavy machinery, the risk of injury from seizure activity can be very high. Driving is also restricted in patients with seizures. Driving restrictions are often a huge deal to many patients. Driving restrictions can make it a major challenge to work, take care of your family, or to socialize. Other important issues for people with epilepsy are problems with depression and anxiety. People with epilepsy have a higher likelihood to develop mood disorders than the general population. Seizures can cause stress, which may contribute to depression 
or other psychological problems. Also, research suggests seizure activity can lead to chemical changes in the brain, such as hormones and neurotransmitters that could also lead to the development of mood problems. Individuals with epilepsy often have memory complaints. This is an important issue because doing one's best in school, work, or taking care of family requires your best memory and concentration. There are many factors that can cause memory problems. Seizures and medication side effects are common factors that can significantly impair memory in some individuals with epilepsy. Recognizing the symptoms of common problems associated with epilepsy and seeking support for them can improve the quality of life of those that face these challenges. There are many resources available that can help people learn to live with and understand epilepsy. Talk to your healthcare provider for more information on resources for epilepsy education and support. Okay, so clearly epilepsy can have a real impact on your lifestyle. So let's talk a little bit about causes of epilepsy. In the majority of patients, almost three quarters of them, we don't have an identifiable cause, and that's what we call idiopathic epilepsy. So in other words, something is wrong uh, up there that's causing this abnormal electrical discharge, but we just really don't know. And they may not have a family history that would put them at risk, et cetera, and things like that. In other uh, cases, we may know. So we know that, for instance, traumatic brain injury um, can cause uh, seizure disorder. So that's why, for instance, um, in California, um, teenagers and such, little kids have to wear helmets when they ride bicycles. Adults really should wear um, helmets because um, that's a common uh, cause of trauma to the brain is bicycle accidents. Also motor vehicle accidents commonly can cause brain trauma. Um, infections. Um, can, you know, like um, central nervous system, infect meningitis, things like that, can uh, lead to damage in the brain that, that results in seizures. Tumors uh, can be involved with that. Strokes, some people who've had a stroke are left with a seizure disorder. Um, there may be some genetic issues going on. There's some genetic disorders that, that are associated with it. But then also prenatal damage. So in other words, during the birth, something can happen. Um, so for instance, if the baby's coming out um, and gets stuck in the birth canal and there's um, a restriction in the umbilical cord and not enough oxygen getting to the brain that can cause brain damage and that child may very well um, end up having a seizure disorder. But far and away, uh, we don't know really um, what the cause is. We do know that there's some things, um, and particularly some of these we see in our population um, at VMRC that increase the risk of, of having epilepsy. Um, mental retardation, intellectual disability um, is associated with a higher risk and other developmental disorders like autism are also associated with higher risk of epilepsy. Cerebral palsy, many, many of the, the consumers that I see that have cerebral palsy also have seizures. And then Alzheimer's disease, and as I said, people who've had strokes um, are at increased risk for having seizures. Now, um, there's actually a, a slightly newer classification of seizures um, out there, but um, this is in general uh, the way we look at seizures. There are seizures that we call focal, focal onset. And what that means, I'm going to show you a picture of that in just a moment. What that means is it is not like if the convulsion uh, occurs, it's not the entire body. It will be part of the body. And that means that there's just a small area of the brain that is affected. And this can be, uh, the, the person can actually be aware during the seizure or they can have impaired awareness or loss of consciousness um, when that happens. And again, I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And then there are other seizures that we call uh, generalized onset, and that's a larger part of the brain that's involved in the electrical event. So you have um, more generalized uh, features that occur with that. So you have the tonic-clonic, which is, you know, they get tight and then they start having the seizure thing. And there's a number of other ones, uh, different kinds of, of convulsions that can occur. 
And then there are non-motor generalized seizures. In other words, there's not a lot of convulsion. Um, and, and the most typical one of those are what we call absence um, seizures, uh, usually onset in um, childhood. And you don't see a lot of the convulsive activity. You can see some minor um, motoric uh, movements, but um, in general, it's not like the um, motor versions. And then there can be some other unknown onset um, types of um, classifications. So in general, um, I like to think of them as focal versus generalized. That will cover most of the things that you're going to see. So I wanted to show you also what they look like. So when I mention these types, you'll be able to, um, let's see, let me move this a little bit here. You'll be able to see actually what I'm talking about. And this is an example of a focal seizure right here. Okay, notice on his left side what's going on. He also, if you notice, he's not responding to these guys around him. So he has impaired awareness. Okay. So let's, let's get out of here. Let's go to the tonic clonic seizure. An urgent message to anyone with type 2 diabetes or pre diabetes. This discovery could save your life. Get out of there. Get my YouTube working. Here we go. Never know. I like video games. You like video games. One. Excuse me, ma'am, can you please pass me my sweater and my bag? Okay. Sure, what happened? I have epilepsy. I call 911? No, 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 and it's okay. It's, it's not an emergency. Well, is he going to swallow his tongue? Are you supposed to put a spoon in his mouth or something? Honestly, if we put anything in his mouth right now, he's, he's going to either choke or he's going to break his teeth on it. The best thing we can do is just, just wait it out. We just got to make sure he's safe and there's nothing around him where he can harm himself. I'm here. Okay, that was actually an excellent video with a lot of good tips in there about what to do um, excuse me, when you uh, see this going on. So um, uh, one of the things I did want to point out though, is you don't, you don't try to restrain the person. You don't put anything in their mouth, including your fingers, um, if you like your fingers, because they will bite. 
they may bite hard. The other thing uh, I want you to notice is that when the seizure began, she really cradled him so that he didn't you know, crash into the ground. Fortunately, he was on grass, but let's say he were on a sidewalk or the street or something. Uh, when he falls, he could hurt himself. He could hit his head. So you can cradle them as they go down and then give them some room. You don't try to restrain them, et cetera. So that was actually a very excellent see, um, video. And I wanted to show you what the absence seizures look like because they are different. Absence seizure, generally the concept is that they're disconnected for a few moments. They're very likely to pick up exactly where they left off, but generally speaking, they do not know what is happening in that three, four, five second period of time. This girl has absence seizures and you will see her have one while she's talking. <laughs> Because he can be as heavy as ever. Exactly. There's a real blankness, a vacant look in the eye. And then all of a sudden, they're right back with you and able to engage. Oh, Absence seizures can be mistaken for daydreaming. One of the hallmarks of absence is that the seizures happen many times in a day. Sometimes they're so fleeting, they're easy to miss. This boy is having frequent but very brief episodes. You can see his eyes flutter up. He's out of touch. Then he becomes fully aware again. Absence seizures usually require no first aid. However, they should be reported if seen for the first time. Any information the child missed should be repeated. Okay, so um, things that might indicate to you that a seizure is occurring, um, as you just saw in that video, periods of blank stares or blackouts, obviously anything um, like abnormal movements, um, you know, shaking kinds of things that look like convulsions, uh, sudden jerking movements, falls, particularly those from where there's no reason for the person to fall, or what would look like maybe fainting spells could actually be um, a seizure happening. So as we've talked about focal versus generalized seizures, this uh, picture on the left shows you uh, what a normal brain is. And then the middle one shows you where there's a small area of electrical activity or abnormality, and that would lead to a focal seizure. Whereas this on the lower right corner shows you a larger area of the brain that is involved. And that's what leads to generalized epilepsy. And the other thing I wanted to show you is with this diagram on the right, is that of course, different areas of the brain do different things. So you can see here, for instance, the frontal lobe controls movement and things like that. Temporal lobe, hearing and speech. So the manifestation of the electrical activity uh, will uh, be determined uh, by which area of the brain um, where the activity is happening. So what do we do in terms of working up someone uh, who's had a seizure? Um, we try to identify the type. One of the things that you can do as, our, as you care for our consumers is if they do have a seizure, then you can um, characterize it for the um, physicians who will be taking care of that person. So was it just one side of the body, one part of the body? Was it the whole body? What happened before the seizure? What happened after the seizure? So um, that's really, really important in helping the physicians to um, determine what's going on and how they want to approach treatment and things. And since you're right there with the consumer, really, really important for you to document what happened, how long, and, and those kinds of things. Then there will be, you know, a, a clinical assessment, including a good, good workup that would include blood work also, because we need to look at various things like electrolyte levels and things like that. Um, you may also see an electroencephalogram, uh, EEG, um, where they're looking for abnormal brain waves. If there's a suspicion that there might be something going on um, sort of physically in the brain, you know, say a tumor or um, a vascular abnormality or something along those lines, then you may see a radiographic um, workup that include a, a CT scan, MRI, or, or even a PET scan.
And then you start looking for any potential causes. But as I said, uh, for the majority of patients who just um, develop a seizure disorder, uh, we often do not know um, what the cause is. So there's, there are things that you can share, as I said, when you talk to the care provider for these consumers when they do have a seizure, what was going on before, and there you're looking for triggers. And I'm gonna to talk to you a moment about things that can trigger seizures, but was, were, were any of those things going on? Uh, what what uh, symptoms were there before the seizure started? Was anything else going on that might have, have uh, precipitated? If they're taking anti-seizure drugs or ASDs, were they actually taking them, okay? One of the most common, not necessarily in consumers because we watch their meds, but one of the most common reasons for people having repeated seizures when they're on these anti-seizure drugs is that they don't take them. So non-adherence is um, fairly common. And um, for most patients, missing one dose probably is not going to cause a, a seizure, but missing more than one dose or a whole day's worth of doses or something is more likely to, to lead to that. How did it start and how did it progress? So again, did it start um, with a focal um, seizure? And sometimes those can become generalized seizures because the abnormal um, electrical uh, activity in that part of the brain can actually spread to other parts of the brain and it becomes a generalized seizure. Was there any loss of consciousness or impairment of awareness, and those kinds of things? And then how did the person feel afterwards? And as the video said, um, most often they will feel tired, they'll feel fatigued, they'll feel like they want to go to sleep and, um, um, and those sorts of things. Now, as I said, there are certain things that can trigger seizures. So things like not taking your medications or uh, when we adjust the doses of medications, for most of these, we're going to be doing blood work to see what the concentration of the drug is in the blood, because we know that there's certain target levels that we're going to aim for with these drugs. And uh, everybody's an individual. Some require more, some require less, but we're going to be checking those blood levels to see that we're at least in the therapeutic range. Stress and worry can be triggers. Inadequate sleep actually in fatigue actually is a very common trigger. Hormonal changes um, through the menstrual cycle, those kinds of things, dehydration. Um, another thing that's very interesting is uh, for some patients, not everyone, flickering lights or rapidly changing video pictures um, can be triggers. There was uh, some cartoon that came out of an Asian country I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or something like that, that um, involved a lot of fast movement on the screen and actually in some people triggered seizures. Now, many of the drugs that people take illicitly, um, for instance, um, methamphetamine, stimulants, those kinds of things um, can actually reduce what we call the seizure threshold or, or the amount of electrical impulse that it takes to trigger off a seizure. Um, alcohol can also do that. So the, you know, uh, obviously we, wanna, we don't want our patients using illicit drugs, but we also wanna make sure that they, um, if, they if they're not absent from alcohol, they're at least not um, drinking very much because it can, can trigger seizures. And then lastly, fever, fever. We call those febrile seizures. Febrile is the word for fever. There will be some children who do have febrile seizures, and that is they get a fever, they have a seizure, they don't have a fever, they don't have a seizure. So it may or may not be a signal that later on down the road, they're going to have epilepsy. But I will say this, um, any seizure that occurs in a kid is a scary thing, particularly for a mom and dad. And um, so obviously they need to be seen by their physician, but one febrile seizure may or may not um, cause the physician to do anything in terms of treatment. When I was um, a young student and early um, practitioner, we did try and uh, if these people have many, these kids have many febrile seizures, we would give them medications um, every day to try and prevent it. And that is not a strategy that we use for most patients today. But there are some who have high risk and physicians uh, may have you um, have some medication at home to give the child if he or she does have a febrile seizure. So if we don't treat it, the seizure itself is usually not life-threatening. 
But if it occurs at the wrong time or in a place, uh, that really an opportune place, like while you're driving or something where there's physical dangers, it can obviously be life-threatening. Hence, that's why people who don't have their seizure disorder control don't get to um, drive. Uh, DMV will put a hold on your driver's license. Now that said, prolonged seizures can damage the brain. And so that was one of the things you saw in the video where she said, you know, this is not an emergency. So the seizure only lasted about five minutes and then he was okay. And the seizure did not come back. If um, the, the seizure time is prolonged or if they keep coming back, that can cause damage to the brain and to, to other organs in the body. And that, as I said before, there is a, what's called sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. We're not sure how to predict that. We just know that, that is something that, that can happen. Unfortunately, it is a, a, a low risk. It's a low number of people. They've looked at some long-term problems. As I said, um, increased risk for depression um, and suicide in these folks, decreased quality of life. And uh, for some, it, increase, it increases risk of even uh, decreases in IQ. Part of that could be the epilepsy, but also part of it could be the impact of some of the medications we use, which um, can impact a person's ability to pay attention and to learn. So what are we trying to do? What are the goals of therapy for treating epilepsy? One is obviously to reduce the seizures as much as possible. The gold standard would be no seizures because if you're seizure free, then you can resume pretty much a normal life. But as I said before, to achieve um, no seizures could require more medications than the person can tolerate. And at that point, um, many people go try non-drug measures. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but things like epilepsy surgery where they actually go into the brain and excise out uh, they, they're able to identify the area of the abnormal focus. They can excise that part of the brain and reduce seizures. We're also trying to prevent long-term complications. So these things that I told you about, like um, bone density issues, hormonal changes and things, we try to, to reduce those side effects. We want to uh, optimize quality of life, allow them to function and do activities of daily living as much as we can. And fortunately for most patients, we can do that. Uh, we want to minimize side effects. As I said, some of the uh, anti-seizure drugs, particularly the older ones, the ones that first came out, can have some pretty significant side effects, whereas the, we have many newer agents now that are um, better tolerated and um, easier for patients to take. So fortunately today, uh, versus when I was in school 40, uh, 40 plus years ago, um, we have many more anti-seizure drugs than we did back then. So we have some options to tailor therapy to the individual patient. So there are certain drugs, you know, that we would prefer in a patient. Um, let's say the patient had epilepsy and migraine headaches. Well, in that situation, we might prefer um, a drug called topiramate or valproic acid because they can prevent migraine. So sometimes individual patient characteristics come into the uh, medication selection process, but we're clearly going to try and tailor therapy to the individual person. So when you look at the overall treatment plan for people with epilepsy, there's several things we're going to, we have to do. Medications, obviously they're going to get medications once they have epilepsy and have had repeated seizures. We're obviously going to give them anti-seizure drugs. You need to make some lifestyle changes that we talked about making sure, for instance, that they're not getting stressed all the time, that they're not workaholics, that they're getting plenty of sleep, um, eating a good diet, et cetera, healthy diet. Um, that's really important. Some other things that we can do for patients, non-drug uh, therapies, we can do what's called vagal nerve stimulation. The vagus nerve is in the body and we can stimulate that and that can be uh, lead to reduced seizures. And as I said, some patients are candidates for epilepsy surgery, and that's where the epileptologists and the neuropsychologists come along and they try to identify the actual place in the brain where the abnormal um, activity is happening. They'll um, work with surgeons to see if it's accessible to them and if everything is just right, then they can go in and actually take out part of that brain. And very often there's um, very little deficit left. Um, and of course, they consider all of that 
as they as they're looking at the surgery where is it what would happen if i took that part of the brain out they're very good at that stuff lastly is what's called the ketogenic diet and what we actually do is give you a diet that causes a condition in the body that's called ketosis so for instance you eat a lot of fats and you don't eat much in the way of carbohydrates and what that does is it creates ketones in the blood system and that's associated with the reduced risk of seizure. The problem with the ketogenic diet is it's extremely difficult to keep patients on that diet. And so it is something that can be used, but it, it uh, can be difficult for patients to tolerate and it may or may not work um, long-term for you. So as I said, there are um, things that affect how we choose to manage our patients, obviously the type of seizure, um, other things like causes, are, are there correctable causes? So if it's not um, idiopathic, is it something that we can correct? Is it um, a metabolic problem? Is it, um, you know, they've been using illicit drugs or whatever. Can we, can we correct that? Age and gender comes into play. There are issues that we have to consider when we're treating women of childbearing age, because some of these anti-seizure drugs can damage the fetus, and that's called teratogenicity. So um, we have to be careful about that. There's um, some vitamin supplementation we have to do in women of childbearing age, et cetera. Similarly, in the elderly, we have to think about their um, physiology and, and such. Um, how often do the seizures occur? So again, um, we, we want people to be seizure free, but that can be hard to achieve. And there are some people who maybe don't care if they drive or not, um, may not want to take four medications to keep themselves uh, from having a seizure. So that's a patient choice kind of issue. What other conditions does the patient have? So for instance, like I told you, patients who have epilepsy and, and migraine headaches, um, some of the drugs that we treat epilepsy with will actually prevent migraine headaches. So in that situation, we might um, benefit two conditions with one medication. And then obviously the impact of potential side effects. So some of these drugs, for instance, can cause a lot of sleepiness. For instance, the pyramate um, can make people feel really cognitively slowed down. Um, that may not be such a good choice in a person who has to remain very mentally alert. So Again, uh, seizure type drives uh, choices or our medications. We know for most of these medications what seizures will respond to them. We think about the side effects. Um, some can be, you know, for instance, could be dangerous for a patient um, if they occur. But often these side effects are related to how much drug we're actually giving the person and what the blood concentration ends up being. So um, the higher we drive the dose, obviously, the more likely they are to have side effects. Um, age. Um, some medications, for instance, have only been approved in adults, and then later on as experience is gained and um, physicians begin to use it in an off-label uh, situation in children, we may find the drug company does clinical trials and it gets approved in children. Childbearing potential is something that we really focus on with women um, in the childbearing um, age group because, as I said, some of these can damage the fetus. And so what we recommend is that women with epilepsy, if they're planning to have a family, that they do the family planning in concert with their uh, treating physicians so that we can think about the medications they're on. Maybe we want to get them transitioned over to a less risky medication, et cetera. And as I said, there's some um, supplements like folic acid and things that we need to give uh, women who uh, do become pregnant. Drug interactions is a big, big deal. Many of these drugs, particularly the older or what we call first generation drugs, have some serious um, drug interactions. Now your pharmacist is gonna be watching those because when we get these prescriptions, we know what your medication profile is. Our um, computers tell us there's a potential drug interaction that we, we need to assess etc. So um, that's something that your physician and pharmacist will look very carefully at um, as these medications are added to your um, profile. And as I said, non-adherence. Um, so you have to ask, well, how easy is it to take the medication? And so some of these medications have to be taken more than one time a day. Some can be taken once a day. And so if a person is having adherence problems, 
uh, we try to get them on the longer acting medications because then they take it fewer times a day. The downside to that, of course, if they're taking once daily medication um, and they don't take it today, well, that leaves them uncovered for a longer period of time. Another thing that's extremely important, and as I think about consumers, um, I wanna make a point of this. These medications should never be just stopped because that increases the risk then of going ahead and having a seizure. So if these medications are gonna be stopped or they're gonna be changed to another medication, we generally taper off the first medication and, and as we adjust up the next medication or whatever, but we don't just stop it cold turkey. But one of the things that happens in some of our um, consumers, I read the um, serious uh, event reports and uh, people miss getting their refills from the pharmacy. Something happens, whatever, it wasn't ordered. They didn't have any refills left on the prescription. The physician's out of town and they couldn't, the pharmacy couldn't get it approved or whatever. I see a number of our consumers who end up um, missing getting their refills. Now with these anti-seizure drugs, um, that can be a problem because if, they, if, they, if there's no refills left on the prescription, it can be difficult to get medications to you. Although I will say this, pharmacists in California, if you were on an anticonvulsant medication and you ran out and your physician's not coming back to town till Friday or Monday, I, as a pharmacist, if you've been on this for a long time, I can do an emergency refill and then contact the physician. So all is not lost. I'm just saying for our consumers who are on anti-seizure drugs, stay on top of how many they have left in their prescription bottles. And when they start getting down to about a week or so of supply left, that's when you need to notify the pharmacy that you need a refill because you do not want your consumers running out of their anti-seizure drugs. It's extremely important. As I said, uh, different anti-seizure drugs work for different kinds of seizures. So for instance, if you look at primary or generalized tonic-clonic seizures, valproic acid, which is Depakote, the brand name is one of them is Depakote, and there are alternative agents. I only show you this table just to illustrate that we have a lot of anti-seizure drugs out there. Some work for both seizure types, some work only for one seizure type. Some are FDA approved for, for instance, partial seizures or you know, focal, excuse me, focal seizures. Um, but as time goes on and we try them and people have generalized seizures, we find that they work there too. So, um, but that goes into our selection process. You'll see different treatment guidelines uh, from the um, organizations that prefer one drug we call over others, we call those first line agents and then alternatives. And what that means is these first line agents have a lot of evidence to suggest that they're effective. The alternative agents may be less uh, effectiveness or harder for the patient to tolerate. So we prefer something that's um, easier for them to take without side effects. Now, because there's so many anti-seizure medications, it's impossible for me to put a slide up here that shows you all the different side effects that you should look for. Those of you who've uh, been in my classes before know that um, I generally promote that on your smartphone, because uh, almost all of us have smartphones today, you can access um, drug information about these anti-seizure drugs that your consumers are taking. I've told you you can get an app called Apoc e Epocrates, or you can um, go to a website like Medline Plus, those kinds of things. And so um, you can get information on the individual medications. But maybe the easiest thing to do is when the consumer's prescription is refilled, it usually gets to you in a bag. And in that bag is a patient handout. And in there, it will tell you all about the medication, how it's supposed to be given, how it's supposed to be stored. And there will be precautionary things that you can uh, look at to tell you about the kinds of side effects that you might see. So for your consumer who gets a refill or a brand new uh, prescription for an anti-seizure drug, just take that paper and uh, keep it on hand and you can, can look at it to see what might happen with their medication. Now, the reason I say that is because those of you who are taking care of consumers, like in a facility, um, you're the frontline people who will see if all of a sudden 
this person um, has an issue that could be a side effect from the anti-seizure drug, and then you can alert the care providers so that we can take a look at that. Now, with that said, there are some general kinds of side effects that you can see with most of the anti-seizure drugs. One of the most common is drowsiness and feeling slowed, mental slowing or tired. Um, that may get better with time. As you take the medication, you begin to tolerate it better. Rash uh, can occur. Um, you obviously want to report that, right? But uh, you know, small rash, limited area may or may not be a big issue, but extensive rashes are a huge issue with some of these drugs because they can be very serious, lead to things like Stevens-Johnson syndrome where you exfoliate your skin. So any rash that you see on your consumer who's taken an anti-seizure drug needs to be reported. Other things that can happen is because of some of the sedating properties and other things, they can become unsteady in their walking and can increase the risk of falls. So these drugs in general do increase fall risk. So you need to watch your consumers, again, taking all the precautions that you normally would to reduce falls. They can also cause stomach complaints, upset stomach, and things like this. More serious kinds of side effects, things like fever. Uh, some of these can affect white blood cell counts, so you might uh, have an infection. As I said, extensive rashes are a very serious thing, signs of infection, easy bruising, pinpoint uh, kinds of rashes because it can affect um, platelet function, swollen glands, loss of appetite. These are the things that are more serious. Obviously, you report any side effect for a consumer to the care provider, but some of them may or may not result in a change of therapy. Now, what do we know about treatment response? Well, as I said, about half of patients, 47%, uh, nearly 50%, can be controlled on one medication. About 13% of patients require two medications, 4%, three or more, and about a third or a little bit more than a third, 36% of patients may not become entirely seizure-free. And again, that has an impact on quality of life and ability to do certain things. But the good news from this slide is about half of people can be controlled on one medication. And that's really a good thing because that minimizes the chances of um, serious side effects because, or I should say additive side effects. The more medications we use, the more likely we are to see side effects, particularly if, if both drugs cause a lot of sleepiness, you put two of them together, you're gonna get more sleepiness, right? So, um, so there's good news on this slide and then there's some stuff that you know, it can be a challenge. So for those who are not seizure-free, that's where um, the physicians will start thinking about things like a vagal nerve stimulator or possibly epilepsy um, surgery for those non-medication kinds of approach, approaches. Now, why might a medication fail? And again, as I said, maybe not so much for consumers unless they refuse their medications, but Generally, you're helping them. Generally, they're taking the medication. But if you look at the population as a whole, as I said, one of the most common reasons for repeated seizures is the medication simply is forgotten. It's not taken. They can't afford it, whatever it is. Um, another reason is that the dose of the medication isn't adequate. And so that's why your physician will start the medication, usually at a lower dose, and then titrate up through the therapeutic dose range. And as you go up, you're looking for how well the seizure is controlled, but also how well is the patient tolerating the medication. If they're still having seizures and you're, you haven't maxed out the dose of the drug, we will generally just increase that first drug, make sure the patient's still tolerating it, tolerating it and then we'll see um, if we've gotten rid of the seizure. So um, effectiveness and tolerability are two really important things. And then lastly, the medication just simply may not be effective for that person's seizure time. So what about how do we approach, you know, how do we go through the process? Well, um, as I said, the first seizure may not be um, treated. However, there are ways of estimating uh, the risk of that happening. And if you have a person who has a really high risk seizure type, you may in fact see um, therapy started even after the first seizure, but generally we wait. Uh, you always try to start with one medication. If you start with two, 
and the seizures go away, you're never really quite sure, well, did I need both? Which one worked? Which one didn't work? Those kinds of things. Plus, you get additive side effects. So we almost always start with one medication and we optimize it, which means working up through the dose range until you either see and control of the seizures or you get to the top of the dose range or you get to a place where it's not tolerated. Um, if I give you enough of any of these drugs, you're going to get side effects. And you're going to say, you know, that's enough. I can't take any more of this drug. As I said, you, you consider all these things in the patient. What kind of seizure do they have? A seizure type? What other medications are they on? What personal characteristics do they have, et cetera? But as I said, the general process is one medication, start low, begin to adjust up, watching all the time, give them each dose level time, see what happens to the seizure frequency, and then you watch tolerability. It really is the interplay between those three things. This is sort of a schematic view that shows what I just said. This is out of a therapeutics textbook that we actually use at the School of Pharmacy where I occasionally teach. And so you make the diagnosis and it says you begin with one anti-seizure drug. You choose it based on these characteristics that we talked about. And then you go to the next box. Are they seizure free? Um, if they are not, but they're also tolerating the drug reasonably well, then you increase the dose. And you again see if they're having seizures. If they're not, you stay at that dose. If they're still having seizures, you increase it till you go throughout the dose range or they can't tolerate anymore. At that point, if they're at the max dose and you've had some reduction in seizure frequency, the physician then has a choice. Do I just add something or am I going to do a change strategy where I would um, reduce maybe the dose of the first agent, adding the second agent, and then begin to increase the second agent as you begin to decrease the first agent. But the physicians will manage that. I just wanted to give you a general idea of how we approach medication management in these folks. As I said, we do have non-medication um, things that we can do for patients uh, with epilepsy. There's epilepsy surgery. There's the ketogenic diet. You can see things on here like protein and, and fats. You don't see a lot of carbohydrates there on the keto diet. And then the vagal nerve stimulator is shown here and you have an electrode that actually um, attaches to the vagus nerve and you have a controller or a pulse generator down here in your chest um, that will um, uh, generate an electrical impulse that stimulates the vagus nerve and that can reduce um, seizure frequency. For many people, this is a, is a very effective modality. Obviously, it has to be implanted into the chest, so there's a, a minor surgical procedure, and then the, the lead from it that goes to stimulate the nerve is, is run up there. But for many people, that can be a very effective um, treatment. Now, I wanted to um, show you briefly a um, video about first aid because you guys are going to be around our uh, consumers, and you're going to be the ones who are most likely to uh, witness them having a seizure. So what should you do? Seizures vary in type, but this is the kind most of us have seen. It's called a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, or grand mal. It's caused by a disturbance in the brain's normal electrical activity. First aid for seizures is simple. Protect from injury, especially to the head. Remove glasses or other potentially harmful objects. Turn on one side to prevent choking. Check for a medical ID. Don't put anything in the mouth. And don't hold down, because restraint could cause bone or muscle injury. The likelihood that someone can die during a seizure is very small. And although the person may look as if they're going to die, that is that they oftentimes will become uh, somewhat blue. Uh, there may be some changes in the breathing pattern. Uh, these are all part of the seizure itself, and they are all very temporary uh, parts of the seizure. Seizures usually end spontaneously after a minute or two. So what but afterwards, the person may be sleepy, agitated, or confused. A seizure can occur at any age from the very old to the very young. An ambulance should be called for a first time seizure when someone is injured, pregnant, has diabetes, 
or when seizures are prolonged or occur one after the other. It's very important to time the seizure. And if the seizure lasts more than five minutes, that's when you should be concerned and be calling an ambulance. The most important thing that you could do for someone having a seizure is to stay calm, to be with them and to be reassuring. And when it's over, just, you know, act like everything's okay. You know, be reassuring because it isn't any fun to have a seizure. And when the seizure is over, you need to know that you still have your friends and they accept you. So um, one of the things I did want to mention here uh, in this first aid response is your facility may have a policy about what to do um, after the seizure. Obviously, you might have a policy that says, well, we're going to take this person to the emergency department or whatever. Um, you may have a policy that says we're going to call 911, maybe not just after five minutes or whatever. But in general, these uh, guidelines do apply. So you want to know what your facility's policy is. Another thing to do is um, know, have, have guidelines from the person's uh, care provider, physician, on what to do should a seizure occur. Does the care provider want you to take them to the ED or just simply watch them and if they uh, return uh, to normality, after the seizure, maybe just continue to watch them for a period of time. So this is something you need to know in advance for your consumers who have um, epilepsy. What, what does the care provider really want you to do? Obviously, if the seizure goes on, you need to just deal with that and call 911 and get them um, taken in for care. So again, remaining calm is a big deal. It's not easy to be calm. I can remember the first time I saw a patient having a seizure, um, it was really pretty shocking um, to me. Don't try to restrict movement. Don't put anything in their mouth. If it's possible to remove things like glasses so they don't you know, bang them, whatever, get hurt with their glasses. If you can, put them on their side because uh, the whole thing about swallowing a tongue, that's just like an urban legend, that doesn't happen. But can, can saliva uh, fall to the back of the throat? Sure it can, and, and they might um, aspirate that. So if you can, without uh, really restraining them, put them, put them on their side um, and, and keep the airway clear if you can. You don't have to do CPR for these folks unless something really drastic does happen. They choke and they're not breathing, or if they, had, for some reason, a cardiac event or um, something along those lines. As I said, there's some things that you don't do. Uh, you don't restrain, et cetera. But another one is you also don't try to dose them up with medication. There may be an exception to that, though. For people who have really frequent uh, recurrent seizures, sometimes physicians will give um, things like rectal diazepam or rectal valium. Um, that comes in a, a, uh, a deal that is made to put the drug in the rectum because there's good absorption there, as you know, from suppositories and things like that. But there's a thing called um, diastat that you can actually give the person um, some diazepam, which is an anti-seizure drug. And I see some of our consumers do have orders for that. So sometimes people with really serious seizures that may go on for a long time, um, and they're predictable, physicians will order those kinds of things, okay? So um, there are some times when you would call 911 if the seizure goes on longer than five minutes. If it's a first time seizure, um, you should get them seen obviously because it could be some problem that, that may need to be corrected. Uh, any kind of seizure after an injury. So if you know if a person's fallen off a bike, hit their head and they look just fine, but then you know, the next day or that night they're having a seizure, that needs to be looked at also. I did wanna take a moment to talk a little bit about issues for women uh, in terms of treating epilepsy. Um, their their uh, treatment can be affected by uh, obviously what's going on with their hormonal system. So, um, you know, during puberty or um, during their monthly cycles, hormone levels obviously can change uh, and that can affect the um, risk of a seizure 
and in effect, um, seizure frequency. Um, sexual issues, um, because some of these drugs can reduce the efficacy of oral contraceptives. Now, your pharmacist uh, would pick that up as a drug interaction. So if you have someone who's taking an oral contraceptive and they get placed on one of these anti-seizure drugs that can increase the metabolism or the breakdown of those uh, hormones that you're taking in and reduce the effectiveness of them in terms of contraception, your pharmacist should pick that out. Um, but your physician also is likely to know <clears throat> which of these drugs might affect um, women who are taking oral contraceptives, hormonally based oral contraception. Some of these uh, medications can cause sexual dysfunction. That would be something you'd want to talk to the person about if they're sexually active. And as I said, um, uh, particularly women of childbearing age, we need to be very careful with because some of these drugs are what we call teratogens. And that means that they can cause birth defects. And also whenever a mother has had the baby and then she is breastfeeding, some of these anticonvulsants can uh, pass into the breast milk. And so there's some safety issues that we can uh, look at there. There are things we can do. It's not to say that you won't be able to breastfeed. It's just that we need to think clearly about how we're going to do that, the timing of it versus when you take your dose and, and those kinds of things can become issues. And for some of these drugs, um, breastfeeding is probably okay. Other things that we do is we watch and see if the seizures are, are related to the hormonal cycle. Um, uh, during these times, we want to make sure that when we're treating our patients that we're keeping the blood concentrations in the right um, area. We generally supplement women with epilepsy with folic acid and, and then if they're pregnant, we might give them vitamin K before um, delivery because um, some of these drugs can cause um, bleeding issues in the fetus. And so just before pregnancy, we can reverse that with vitamin K. And many of the times now we can use some of these newer drugs that I told you we have that may be less likely to cause teratogenic effects. And as I said, it's more likely with the older drugs like valproic acid is very risky drug. Phenytoin, carbamazepine, um, these older drugs are all more likely to cause teratogenic effects. And so um, one of the strategy, strategies that could be applied is if you know well in advance that this uh, woman is uh, planning to have a family, is it might be uh, feasible, for instance, to transition from one higher risk drug to uh, one lower risk drug. Um, but the epileptologists are, are really good at this kind of stuff. And so again, contraception, pregnancy planning ahead of time is, is the best way to, to go about this. Uh, I also said that there's some issues um, in the elderly. It is, um, uh, it, it is frequent, um, but uh, it may be uh, difficult to determine exactly what's going on with the seizure type in the elderly because of different things that are going on with them. Also, many patients as we age uh, find it more difficult to tolerate some of these drugs. I already mentioned fall risk, for instance. Drugs that are sedating, um, those that cause a lot of unsteadiness um, at higher doses and things like that it could be difficult for an older person to tolerate. So we're going to be very careful about that because when when older people uh, fall, they tend to break bones, and that's just not good at all. Um, many older people are already taking medications and complex regimens, and you know, now you're adding an anti-seizure drug that just makes it more difficult to know when to take drugs and things. Drug-drug interactions can be uh, more common and more difficult to uh, manage in the elderly. It also <clears throat> it just makes it harder for the elderly to live independently. So this all has to be taken into consideration. What about kids? Um, some of these drugs can affect um, development. Usually it's the older ones that, that we worry about. And so today, fortunately, we have a lot of newer medications that are less risky um, in that respect. Obviously, parents need to be involved in the care, um, the planning with these kids, making sure they're able to take their medications and such. It could affect their ability to leave the kid at daycare. If they do leave the child at daycare, there needs to be really clear instructions on what to do. Um, sometimes in daycare, they might have to administer the kid's uh, 
medication, like if they have a dose due around lunchtime or something, they have to pay attention to that. Um, some of these drugs, uh, particularly mostly the older ones, can affect a child's ability to pay attention, stay awake in class because they are sedating and those kinds of things. And it does impact family dynamics when you have someone with seizures. It just changes some of the things you uh, have to be concerned about. Teenagers, um, there's some things to be considered there that's different for them. So for instance, um, how does having a seizure disorder impact their life? So like when I was um, early teens, the biggest thing that I could wait for was turning 16 and get my driver's license. That was a huge thing to me. And if I have epilepsy and they're telling me, well, you can't have a driver's license, that's a big deal. It affects, it affects a whole lot. You know, not only can I not drive to football games, maybe I can't date. All these things are, are important, but particularly to um, teenagers. You also, with um, teenagers, have to make sure that they're not experimenting with illicit drugs, um, particularly the stimulants, but also alcohol. It can affect their ability to participate in athletics, particularly if the seizure disorder is not controlled. And um, you need to work with their doctor to make sure that it's okay to do things like play football where there's a potential for um, head injuries. As I said, driving is a big deal to teenagers. Um, and it could have, again, these drugs cause, um, particularly the older ones, can cause some cognitive issues in terms of being able to study, stay awake to study and pay attention and learn and those kinds of things. Now, what else can we do? Well, we can do stress reduction because, as I said, high stress times can increase your risk of having a seizure. So we teach relaxation techniques. Just some good general health tips. Need to eat a good, healthy diet, avoiding a lot of junk foods, and you don't skip meals. Um, you try to get enough sleep. For most people, it's seven to nine hours. You, we always used to hear about eight hours of sleep. Well, it does turn out most people need between seven and nine hours of sleep. Also, um, as you heard in that last video, they said look for a medic alert ID bracelet or tag. So, for instance, many people on their wrist wear a medic alert um, bracelet that says, not only do I have seizures, here's the medications I'm on. Those can be very helpful if you did call 911 and the EMTs come and take them to the emergency department. Those things can be actually very, very helpful. helpful. And then obviously educating people on seizure precautions. I've listed here in, your, uh, in this slide, um, places that you can get some very good information. You can Google these up. These are the web um, uh, sites here. The Epilepsy Foundation is an excellent site uh, to give you information as a patient or if you're going to uh, work with a patient in the family or something like that. The Medic Alert Foundation is where you can get these bracelets that people wear. And then finally, the American Epilepsy Society is also an excellent place to go. So this is the end. If you have questions, well, let me see. I think I might be able to do a Q&A. Let me see. So suggestions for a member in a wheelchair having a seizure. I would probably leave them um, in, the, um, in the wheelchair and not uh, necessarily try to remove them unless they are a fall risk. So um, because you, again, you want to not uh, manipulate the person any more than you have to. So let's say they were in, her, in their wheelchair. You would want to keep them from falling out of the wheelchair if it's possible. Um, if it looks like they are going to come out of the chair, then what I would do is again, very gently while not trying to restrict them is protect particularly the head as they come out of the wheelchair and you can lay them down. Um, I need to qualify this by saying I'm not an expert on that, but my guess is that if they're, if they're having a convulsion and they're not gonna fall out of the wheelchair, just keep them from falling out. Making sure of course that they can breathe that their head's not falling down so that it obstructs the airway, um, those kinds of things. All right, so um, that's all the questions. Now you can always email me. I'm pharmacist at bmrc.net. You can always Dr. email. Dr. Pino, 
Yeah. Just a moment. There's one more. Um, I don't know. Did you answer the previous trainings years ago? Recommended two minutes. Is five minutes now recommended before calling an ambulance? Yes, five minutes appears to be the mark. That's what I found in looking um, at things. Two minutes is a little bit short. Most seizures last more than two minutes. And as you saw here, we had two or three videos that were all in agreement on that five minute mark. Yeah, so I'm good with that. Now, if you want to, <clears throat> excuse me, get credit for this uh, module, you're going to um, email Vicki, right? Yes, at v Fisher, yeah, v Fisher at vmrc.net. Yeah, she'll send you the quiz. And again, like always, you can send her the answers. You can take it, print it, circle answers, scan it, send it back. Get her the answers, and uh, we'll get you a certificate. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for joining us. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at pharmacist at pmrc.net. Thanks so much. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. And I put my email address in the chat box if anybody needs that. Excellent job. Thanks again. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.